This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marion Brown, Toronto, Canada. The Four Million by O. Henry. Chapter 19 Sisters of the Golden Circle. The rubberneck auto was about ready to start. The merry top riders had been assigned to their seats by the gentlemanly conductor. The sidewalk was blockaded with sightseers who'd gathered to stare at sightseers, justifying the natural law that every creature on earth is preyed upon by some other creature. The megaphone man raised his instrument of torture. The inside of the great automobile began to thump and throb like the heart of a coffee drinker, the top riders nervously clung to the seats. The old lady from Valparaiso, Indiana, shrieked to be put ashore. But before a wheel turns, listen to a brief preamble through the cardiophone, which shall point out to you an object of interest on life's sightseeing tour. Swift and comprehensive is the recognition of white man for white man in African wilds, Instant and sure is the spiritual greeting between mother and babe, unhesitatingly do master and dog commune across the slight gulf between animal and man, immeasurably quick and sapient are the brief messages between one and one's beloved, but all these instances set forth only slow and groping interchange of sympathy and thought beside one other instance which the rubberneck coach shall disclose." You shall learn, if you have not learned already, what two beings of all earth's living inhabitants most quickly look into each other's hearts and souls when they meet face to face. The gong word and the glaring at Gotham car moved majestically upon its instructive tour. On the highest rear seat was James Williams of Cloverdale, Missouri, and his bride. Capitalize it, friend, typo, that last word, word of words in the epiphany of life and love, the ascent of the flowers, the booty of the bee, the primal drip of spring waters, the overture of the lark, the twist of lemon peel on the cocktail of creation, such is the bride. Holy is the wife, revered the mother, galiptious is the summer girl, but the bride is the certified check among the wedding presents that the gods send in when a man is married to mortality. The car glided up the golden way. On the bridge of the great cruiser, the captain stood, trumpeting the sights of the big city to his passengers. Wide-mouthed and open-eared, they heard the sights of the metropolis thundered forth to their eyes. Confused, delirious with excitement and provincial longings, they tried to make ocular responses to the megaphonic ritual. In the solemn spires of spreading cathedrals, they saw the home of the Vanderbilts, in the busy bulk of the Grand Central Depot they viewed wonderingly the frugal cot of Russell Sage. Bidden to observe the highlands of the Hudson, they gaped, unsuspecting, at the upturned mountains of a new-laid sewer. To many the elevated railroad was the Rialto, on the stations of which uniformed men sat and made chop suey of your tickets— and to this day in the outlying districts many have it that Chuck Connors, with his hand on his heart, leads reform, and that but for the noble municipal efforts of one Parkhurst, a district attorney, the notorious Bishop Potter gang would have destroyed law and order from the Bowery to the Harlem River. But I beg you to observe Mrs. James Williams, Hattie Chalmers that was, once the belle of Cloverdale, Pale blue is the bride's, if she will, and this color she has honored. Willingly had the moss rosebud loaned to her cheeks of its pink, and as for the violet, her eyes will do very well as they are, thank you. A useless strip of white chaff, oh no, he was guiding the autocar, of white chiffon, or perhaps it was grenadine or tulle, was tied beneath her chin, pretending to hold her bonnet in place but you know as well as I do that the hat-pins did the work. And on Mrs. James Williams's face was recorded a little library of the world's best thoughts in three volumes. Volume number one contained the belief that James Williams was about the right sort of thing. 
volume number two, was the essay on the world declaring it to be a very excellent place. Volume number three disclosed the belief that in occupying the highest seat in a rubberneck auto, they were traveling the pace that passes all understanding. James Williams, you would have guessed, was about twenty-four. It will gratify you to know that your estimate was so accurate. He was exactly twenty-three years, eleven months, and twenty-nine days old. He was well-built, active, strong-jawed, good-natured, and rising. He was on his wedding trip. Dear kind fairy, please cut out these orders for money and forty HP touring cars and fame and a new growth of hair and the presidency of the boat club. Instead of any of them, turn backward. Oh, turn backward and give us just a teeny-weeny bit of our wedding trip over again. Just an hour, dear fairy, so we can remember how the grass and the poplar trees looked and the bow of those bonnet strings tied beneath her chin even if it was the hat-pins that did the work. Can't do it? Very well. Hurry up with that touring car and the oil stock, then. Just in front of Mrs. James Williams sat a girl in a loose tan jacket and a straw hat adorned with grapes and roses. Only in dreams and milliners' shops do we, alas, gather grapes and roses at one swipe. This girl gazed with large blue eyes, credulous, when the megaphone man roared his doctrine that millionaires were things about which we should be concerned. Between blasts she resorted to a Pictetian philosophy in the form of pepsin chewing gum. At this girl's right hand sat a young man about twenty-four. He was well-built, active, strong-jawed, and good-natured. But if his description seems to follow that of James Williams, divested of anything Cloverdalian, this man belonged to hard streets and sharp corners. He looked keenly about him, seeming to begrudge the asphalt under the feet of those upon whom he had looked down from his perch. While the megaphone barks at a famous hostelry, let me whisper you through the low-tuned cardiophone to sit tight, for now things are about to happen, and the great city will close over them again as over a scrap of ticker tape floating down from the den of a broad street bear. The girl in the tan jacket twisted around to view the pilgrims on the last seat. The other passengers she had absorbed, the seat behind her, was her bluebeard's chamber. Her eyes met those of Mrs. James Williams. Between two ticks of a watch they exchanged their life's experiences, histories, hopes, and fancies. And all, mind you, with the eye before two men could have decided whether to draw steel or borrow a match. The bride leaned forward low. She and the girl spoke rapidly together, their tongues moving quickly like those of two serpents, a comparison that is not meant to go further. Two smiles and a dozen nods closed the conference. And now, in the broad, quiet avenue, in front of the rubberneck car, a man in dark clothes stood with uplifted hand, from the sidewalk another hurried to join him. The girl in the fruitful hat quickly seized her companion by the arm and whispered in his ear. That young man exhibited proof of ability to act promptly. Crouching low, he slid over the edge of the car, hung lightly for an instant, and then disappeared. Half a dozen of the top riders observed his feet wonderingly, but made no comment, deeming it prudent not to express surprise at what might be the conventional manner of alighting in this bewildering city. The truant passenger dodged a hansom and then floated past, like a leaf on a stream between a furniture van and a florist's delivery wagon. The girl in the tan jacket turned again and looked in the eyes of Mrs. James Williams. Then she faced about and sat still while the rubberneck auto stopped at the flash of the badge under the coat of the plain-clothes man. "'What's eatin' you?' demanded the megaphonist, abandoning his professional discourse for pure English. "'Keep her at anchor for a minute,' ordered the officer. "'There's a man on board we want, a Philadelphia burglar called Pinky McGuire. There he is on the back seat. Look out for the side, Donovan.' Donovan went to the hind wheel and looked up at James Williams. "'Come down, old sport,' he said pleasantly. "'We've got you.' 
Back to Sleepy Town for yours. It ain't a bad idea, hiding on a rubberneck, though. I'll remember that. Softly through the megaphone came the advice of the conductor. Better stop off, sir, and explain. The car must proceed on its tour. James Williams belonged among the level heads. With necessary slowness, he picked his way through the passengers down to the steps at the front of the car. His wife followed, but she first turned her eyes and saw the escaped tourist glide from behind the furniture van and slip behind a tree on the edge of the little park, not fifty feet away. Descended to the ground, James Williams faced his captors with a smile. He was thinking what a good story he would have to tell in Cloverdale about having been mistaken for a burglar. The rubberneck coach lingered out of respect for its patrons. What could be a more interesting sight than this? My name is James Williams of Cloverdale, Missouri, he said kindly, so that they would not be too greatly mortified. I have letters here that will show. You'll come with us, please, announced the plain clothesman. Pinky McGuire's description fits you like flannel washed in hot suds. A detective saw you on the rubberneck up at Central Park and phoned down to take you in. Do your explaining at the station house. James Williams' wife, the bride of two weeks, looked him in the face with a strange, soft radiance in her eyes and a flush on her cheeks, looked him in the face and said, Go with him quietly, Pinky, and maybe it'll be in your favor. And then, as the glaring at Gotham car rolled away, she turned and threw a kiss. His wife threw a kiss at someone high up on the seats of the rubberneck. Your girl gives you good advice, McGuire, said Donovan. Come on now. And then madness descended upon and occupied James Williams. He pushed his hat far upon the back of his head. My wife seems to think I'm a burglar, he said recklessly. I've never heard of her being crazy, therefore I must be. And if I'm crazy, they can't do anything to me for killing you two fools in my madness. Whereupon he resisted arrest so cheerfully and industriously that cops had to be whistled for, and afterwards the reserves to disperse a few thousand delighted spectators. At the station house, the desk sergeant asked for his name. McDoodle the Pink, or Pinky the Brute, I forget which, was James Williams's answer. But you can bet I'm a burglar, don't leave that out. And you might add that it took five of them to pluck the pink. I'd especially like to have that in the records. In an hour came Mrs. James Williams, with Uncle Thomas of Madison Avenue, in a respect-compelling motor car and proofs of the hero's innocence, for all the world like the third act of a drama backed by an automobile manufacturing company. After the police had sternly reprimanded James Williams for imitating a copyrighted burglar and given him an honorable discharge as the department was capable of, Mrs. Williams re-arrested him and swept him into an angle of the station house. James Williams regarded her with one eye. He always said that Donovan closed the other while somebody was holding his good right hand. Never before had he given her a word of reproach or of reproof. If you can explain... He began rather stiffly. Why you... Dear, she interrupted, listen. It was an hour's pain and trial to you. I did it for her. I mean the girl who spoke to me on the coach. I was so happy, Jim, so happy with you that I didn't dare to refuse that happiness to another. Jim, they were married only this morning, those two, and I wanted him to get away. While they were struggling with you, I saw him slip from behind his tree and hurry across the park. That's all of it, dear. I had to do it. Thus does one sister of the plain gold band know another, who stands in the enchanted light that shines but once and briefly for each one. By rice and satin bows does mere man become aware of weddings. But bride knoweth bride at the glance of an eye, and between them swiftly passes comfort and meaning in a language that man and widows wot not of. End of chapter 19, Sisters of the Golden Circle.